Before we begin, let me briefly introduce the presentation and some important information. We will have two presentations in this session. Each presentation will last 28 minutes in total, give or take, and including question and answer. The first presentation will be presented by Dr. Rick West, Assistant Professor of Psychology and Technology at BYU, and his collaborator. PhD candidate Dan Randall and graduate student Casey Wright. Casey? No, Casey. Okay. All right. And also we're also from BYU. The topic is using open dialect to recognize uh, soft skills. Uh, the research interest includes studying the social nature of learning, online communities, and how to effectively teach technology innovation skills to teachers, including the use of open dialogue. The second presentation will be presented by Dr. Matthew Smith. Uh, he's an assistant professor of learning design and technology at the University of Hawaii. The topic for that session is meant for each other, educational resources and design-based research. Dr. Smith's uh, research interests include the use of 3D learning environments, open source software, game-based learning, and design-based research. I will use cards to notify the presenters when 10, 5, uh, 2, and 1 minutes are left. Right here. Uh, out of courtesy to convention attendees and your fellow presenters, Please try to stay within the time uh, constraint. If the allotted time for the presentation has expired, you're welcome to discuss issues with the presenter after the end of the session. Now let's welcome our first presentation, Using Open Budget to Recognize Soft Skills. OK. I gave you a little hint. I accidentally clicked the button over the side, so you saw, you saw Napoleon already. Um, but Rick, Dan, and I are going to be presenting like as was said, on using open badges to develop and recognize soft skill development. So kind of my part is I'll tell a little bit of the story about how we got to where we're at now. Um, Dan will talk a little bit more about open badges as a resource, because we have two, this, this project we're doing in particular is kind of new, where Rick and Dan have been doing open badges for a couple of years now. Um, and I got involved doing more of the soft skill stuff. So we'll talk about some of this new research we're doing. Dan will kind of tell you where we came from and how we got there. And then Rick will talk a little bit more about um, some of the issues we're running into with our research right now and some further directions that we're going to go from there, too. So we'll go ahead and start out. Um, I want to start with the question about how soft skills really are needed in today's environment. I think it's not really much of a question that that's, that's kind of ramping up that People are more and more interested in soft skills. They're more and more interested in developing soft skills. Um, it's something that we need in today's environment, especially in the workplace. My interests lie particularly in some positive organizational behavior and positive psychology directions. That's what first got me interested in this. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of those. First, though, because we're talking so much about soft skills, I wanted to give a couple definitions that are out there about soft skills, what, what they really are. This one from the Oxford Dictionary is personal attributes that enable someone to interact effectively and harmoniously with other people. Um, the next one is from Heckman and Kautz, which I thought was really interesting because it uses personality traits, which just for me as a researcher makes it even more of a difficult question. How do you teach, learn, and assess and quantify in some way personality traits? Um, but that's also the reason I like research a lot is because tackling difficult questions is, is what researchers do. And so I hope I'm a young graduate student that throughout what I do um, in my life, <laughs> I, I can help um, tease this out a little bit. But personality traits, goals, motivations, and preferences that are valued in the labor market and school and many other domains. That's how Heckman and Kautz defined soft skills. Um, this is a couple research studies. One's a little outdated. I'd be interested to see what the updated version would say. I'd, I'd think it's more. Um, Cox and Osgathorpe back in 2002 did a study seeing what instructional design professionals use their, how they use their time. And they found that instructional design professionals use 30, they're about 35% of their time engaged in soft skill activities, project management, meetings, those types of things, versus 30% in actual design work. 
So it's a slight difference, but they showed evidence that people are actually engaged in soft skill activities more than they are in instructional design. Um, I would think in today's society as more collaboration is important and activities like that, that maybe that's gone up a little bit, but I'm not sure because we don't have a more recent study. This other one on the other side um, was from the ADECO group. They surveyed 500 executives um, and 90% of those executives said that there's a, there's a gap in the workforce. Um, there's, there's skills that aren't being, um, skills needed that aren't really being met, that needs not being met. 40% of those 500, so that's where the 202 out of 460 said that that gap is in soft skills. Um, so there's, there's an obvious gap, there's people who need to develop soft skills, and so this is, this is something that we're trying to tackle. Um, how we got there is kind of through our graduate program. We don't have official learning outcomes for this, uh, but many pro programs, especially in the instructional design, want our graduates, such as me, to be able to have soft skills. Um, to leave the program having good communication skills, good project management skills, creativity skills, things like that. Um, but they're usually not official learning outcomes because they're really difficult to assess. Um, how do you quantify and say, okay, Casey has good professional communication skills, and also that next step then is how to display those skills. So once you've helped facilitate someone learning soft skills, how do you then display them in a, in a, in a way that's gonna have concrete evidence, some, something that's gonna be tangible for an employer? other than just writing on, on a resume, I have soft skills, or LinkedIn's the, the really good example that I get endorsed for things on LinkedIn that I have no skills for. But people are like, oh, Casey, he's, he's done one semester of instructional design school, let's, let's promote him for that, and I'm really not that good at it yet. And so, something that's more reliable and something that's more tangible and concrete is, is needed. Um, so, this is why we decided soft skill badges after the experience that Dan and Rick have in, in developing badges for educational um, pre-service teachers and things like that, we thought, hey, Maybe this would be something that we could use and explore for credentializing soft skills. Um, something that's a little bit more criteria based, based on evidence, has a little bit of an advantage over a recommendation letter, um, provide evidence for meeting criteria. Um, badges can be sh uh, shared in open backpacks, so it's really easy to put that onto your LinkedIn or onto a, a digital resume or a website, um, and it can be one piece of a professional development. So once you're into an organization, maybe organizations could, could use this to help develop um, professional and, and those types of skills. So I'm going to hand this over to Dan, and he'll talk a little bit about what we've done with pre-service teachers and how that translated then into what we're doing now. I'll give you this too. So I'm Dan. Um, who here has worked with open badges? Anyone done anything with open? Oh, wow! Several of you. And who's just heard of open badges? Maybe you haven't worked with them yet, but you've heard of them. So not a lot of newbies here. That's good. So maybe we can just race through some of my stuff and get to the real meat. But just so everyone's on the same page, let me talk a little bit about open badges and particularly how we are using open badges here at BYU. So obviously, we all know Boy Scout badges, merit badges um, from other youth programs. They have lots of great affordances, such as being able to just acknowledge accomplishments um, and being a way for those who have earned them to display their skills and their knowledge. Um, <clears throat> there's a motivational aspect too, for some people, not as much for others. Um, but digital badges is something we've seen happening a lot more lately. So I mean, first they were really happening on social networks and on, in some video games and other environments where it was basically being used as the same thing as, in the same way as they were using merit badges. It's just the digital form thereof. But the cool thing about open badges is that they have the affordances of um, the, the regular merit badges, but they're digital. And since they're digital, there's the potential to do more with them that traditional digital badges weren't actually doing. And open badges are really starting to use those affordances. So <clears throat> you can actually um, use the open badge infrastructure to be able to share those badges. So, um, in places like Khan Academy, they're using digital badges right now as part of learning. Um, and they're doing some really cool stuff, but their badges aren't open. So the badges live inside of Khan Academy and you can't actually get them out. And so um, you might be able to learn something in Khan Academy, be able to earn this badge and say, look, look what I've, what, what I've learned or what I've accomplished. But you can't share that with anyone else really outside of Khan Academy. Um, and the cool thing about open badges is that those are actually shareable because they don't have to live in the environment in which they were issued, but they can go into a central hub, such as Mozilla's backpack, that can then be shared um, with whoever you want to share them with. 
So <clears throat> this is actually the backpack right here. And you notice that we have some badges in here. These are some badges that we've issued out at BYU. Uh, and there are some other badges that we didn't issue, but we learned from other places. So the two in the bottom right corner there were actually um, Mozilla's badges from their WebMaker program. Um, and I don't know where the other one came from. But so already you can kind of see this idea that there's a collection of badges coming from different places that's starting to build a bigger picture of your learning and your abilities. Now, the really cool thing is that you can actually create these collections, that, which are then shareable. So this is a collection of a couple of badges. And you could put these on your web page. You could put these um, through social media, like you could share it on Facebook or Twitter, even attach it to your LinkedIn if you could use a link to just link out to this. And the really cool thing is if we zoom in, we get all this detail. All this metadata is baked into the badge, so we know who issued it, we know the URL for that organization, so that we don't have to say, well, who the heck is IPT Ed Tech? We can go right there and find out. We have the name, we have the description of the badge, and something I think is the awesomest thing is that we have the criteria, and you can also attach evidence. And that really right there is the key, because with so many badges right now, you earn a badge and you don't even know exactly what it's for, I remember when Mozilla's WebMaker first came out, I was playing around with it, trying to um, just see how their system worked. And I'm not super great on CSS. I'm really not. And so I was trying to understand CSS a little bit better, and all of a sudden, bling, this badge popped up. Now you know CSS. I'm like, shoot, what did I do? I didn't know how I'd done it. Um, but now I had the badge to prove that I knew it. Okay, so that's, so that's something that we have to be aware of, I think, is proper assessing of badges. So having the criteria there is key but also the evidence so that people can say, well, you know, I don't know if I really trust this IPT EdTech badge. Um, well, you can go and you can look at the criteria and say, okay, well, that's, that's actually pretty rigorous if I look at the criteria, but how do I know if the assessment was actually good? You can go to that evidence link and you could, if you wanted to, basically assess it yourself. And you say, wow, okay, yeah, the, the criteria's here. I can see that they did that. I can see that they did that. Okay, yeah, this badge really is representational of what they know and what they've done. Now, do you really want to do that every time? Probably not. That's what I think one of the great affordances of badges are, is if you recognize the brand and you know this is a quality badge and it's been well assessed in the past, I can usually just see that badge and assume that and move forward. And so <clears throat> as badges take off, there's that potential to be able to look at the tip of the iceberg and not have to dig down deep just know but by looking at the tip that everything's good to go. But if you're ever concerned, you can always dig down. So it's really making much more clear, much more open and transparent what learning is taking place and the quality of that learning. So uh, with that little understanding of open badges, I think I'll let uh, Rick talk a little bit more about what we're doing with soft skills. Works. It looks like it. I'll just hold it. I'll do the cool thing. This is what the cool thing is. 